Retinal Rounds, episode number 170. Challenging retinal detachment repair in a patient with Stickler syndrome. Retinal detachments in patients with Stickler syndrome can be challenging for a variety of reasons, including the young age of patients at the onset of retinal detachment, abnormal and tight vitreoretinal adhesions, multifocal lattice degeneration, and the potential for numerous and large retinal breaks. Our guest surgeon is Dr. Bruno Felipe Silva, a vitreoretinal fellow at the University of Sao Paulo. His patient is a 14-year-old female who developed a macula sparing retinal detachment, initially treated with an encircling scleral buckle. The patient developed a recurrent retinal detachment and is now undergoing pars plane of vitrectomy. Let's check out the case, and at the end, we'll discuss features of Stickler syndrome and best practices for both preventing and treating associated retinal detachments. Thank you, Dr. Silva, as well as your co-fellow, Dr. Pedro Ogata, and attending Dr. Marcelo Rego for sharing this case. Here's the patient's optos photo at presentation with a macula sparing retinal detachment. You can see that the patient has already undergone some prophylactic retinopexy. The causative break is circled in red, and you can see a cuff of subretinal fluid outlined by the light blue dashed lines extending posteriorly but sparing the macula. Dr. Silva placed an encircling 42 band and applied cryopexy to the infrotemporal retinal break. Now, it's a little difficult to appreciate on the Optos photo, but you can see that postoperatively this patient's retinal detachment has progressed with fluid now extending to the infrotemporal arcade. Now, the initial causative break is circled in red. And you can see that the break appears to be slightly on the downslope of the buccal edge, so it's possible that the break is not being completely supported by the buccal. In addition, circled in yellow are areas of lattice degeneration, which Dr. Silva noted were now associated with micro breaks. So it's unclear if this represents a buccal failure or a progressive retinal detachment due to new breaks. Now, some options during the initial scleral buccal procedure would be one, to retroplace the 42 band to better support the causative break and other areas that are now associated with micro breaks. Two, to place a broader encircling element like an S4050 band, or three, to place a wider element inferiorly like a 276 tire with a 240 band encircling. Now, one could also uh, consider augmenting the laser or cryopexy to include these areas of lattice that are now associated with microbreaks. Nevertheless, at this stage, the surgical options would be to revise the buckle or to perform a vitrectomy. Dr. Silva has opted to proceed with a vitrectomy, so let's check out the case. Okay, Dr. Silva starts with a core vitrectomy and is now instilling triamcinolone to stain the posterior hyaloid. Of course, the, the posterior hyaloid can be particularly adherent uh, to the retinal surface in patients with Stickler syndrome, and so it's very important to ensure that the hyaloid is in fact uh, elevated and detached. And in this case, Dr. Silva is using some forceps to assist in elevation of this particularly adherent posterior hyaloid. So you can see here he's grasped an edge of the vitreous and is pulled in an antero posterior fashion to create some separation or some space between the posterior hyaloid and the underlying retina. And now uh, very slowly and methodically, he's extending uh, the, uh, the posterior vitreous detachment. You can see now the hyaloid has come up and has gone all the way uh, out, uh, at least in the infranasal quadrant to the vitreous base. And now using the vitreous cutter, you can see Dr. Silva is shaving back uh, the, the vitreous, propagating the vitreous detachment, and using with scleral depression is now uh, shaving uh, the vitreous base, particularly inferiorly where this recurrent retinal detachment has occurred. So that, that infrotemporal area uh, has been uh, further shaved, uh, and now perfor perfluorocarbon liquid is being installed over the posterior pole to completely flatten the retina, and the, that subretinal fluid has egressed through that infrotemporal retinal break. Now Dr. Silva has gone to uh, an air fluid exchange, and he's draining uh, the fluid through that causative break infrotemporally with perfluorocarbon liquid, and then takes the perfluorocarbon liquid down, and the retina is completely attached. Now you can see he's applying laser retinopexy around the retinal breaks, as well as in a PRP-like fashion to prevent a future retinal detachment. So here's the patient's post-operative optos photo. You can see that the retina is completely attached under oil and the laser barricade has been augmented around the original break, the new breaks that were associated with lattice, and additional laser has been placed in a PRP-like configuration from approximately the 1.30 to 10 o'clock clock hours. So here's some points for discussion. Stickler syndrome is a hereditary arthroophthalmopathy that is typically inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion for types 1 and 2 and an autosomal recessive fashion in type 4. And it should be noted that spontaneous mutations have also been reported. Now, there are four types of Stickler syndrome. 
Type 1 is associated with mutations in collagen type 2, the COL2A1 gene, and is associated with both ocular and systemic findings. Type 2 Stickler syndrome also has ocular and systemic findings and is associated with mutations in the COL11A1 gene affecting type 11 collagen. Now, type 3 Stickler syndrome associated with COL11A2 mutations is associated with systemic findings only. And type 4 Stickler syndrome is associated with COL9A1, 9A2, and 9A3 mutations, as well as non-collagen mutations. And this type of Stickler syndrome is associated with ocular findings and hearing loss. Ocular findings in Stickler syndrome include optically empty vitreous due to earliest vitreous sinoresis. And that's not to say that nothing is seen in the vitreous cavity, since membranous or even less commonly beaded vitreous condensations may be seen. Other findings include high axial myopia, perivascular lattice degeneration, open angle glaucoma, and early onset cataract. And the biggest uh, ocular concern in Stickler syndrome is the very high rate of retinal detachment in the range of about 60 to 65% with an early age of onset, typically age 11 to 14. A prophylactic laser or cryopexy has been shown to decrease the risk of retinal detachment and uh, has been associated with better long-term visual outcomes in patients with Stickler syndrome. Now, some surgeons target areas of pathology including lattice degeneration, while many favor 360-degree vitreous-based laser, which would involve a PRP-like pattern administered 360 degrees from the equator to the aura. Prophylactic laser is ideally performed before the onset of a retinal detachment, but if a new patient with Stickler syndrome presents with an RD, it's important not only to treat the eye that has a retinal detachment, but also to prophylactically treat the fellow eye. Non-ocular findings in Stickler syndrome include craniofacial abnormalities, which can include a flattened midface, micronathia, which is an underdeveloped mandible, glossoptosis, which is a posteriorly positioned tongue that can sometimes result in airway obstruction, and cleft palate. And all three of these latter uh, findings uh, constitute the Pierre Robin sequence. Hearing impairment is seen in all types of Stickler syndrome that affect the eyes, and the severity can range from mild to severe. Skeletal abnormalities include early onset degenerative joint disease and spine abnormalities like scoliosis and kyphosis that can sometimes be associated with low back pain. Now, when a patient with Stickler syndrome presents with a retinal detachment, one may wonder what is the best first surgical approach? Well, historically, it was felt to be a vitrectomy or combined vitrectomy buckle. However, in this retrospective study by Kirby Taylor, Emmanuel Chang, and co-authors, patients treated initially with a scleral buckle had a significantly greater chance of final anatomic success and significantly better final best corrected visual acuity. Now, scleral buckling first, of course, is exactly the approach taken by Dr. Silva. Again, we want to thank Dr. Silva for sharing this interesting and challenging case and for giving us all an opportunity to learn a little bit more about Stickler syndrome. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please visit us at retinarounds.com. There you can sign up for our email list. You'll get a notification every time a new video is posted. And if you have an interesting video or a tip or trick that you'd like to share, please follow the links on our website and you can upload your video there. Thanks so much for watching.